there are basically three ways right now for a deal to make money. Number one is you basically raise the rent. Number two is you improve your operation or you improve your non-operating, sorry, non-rental income. And number three is your interest rate of the market, right? I want to make sure that I don't control the market, but I can control the non the, the non rental income and also the rent, right? I want to make sure that I'm able to have enough meat on the bone that even though there's nothing happen on the on the rate side, I can also make a lot of money on the other two. This basically yield down to a property that doesn't have the highest rent over its neighborhood. This also means that the property has a lot of uh, meat on the bone on the non-rental income side that I can, for example, build back to the tenant or I can improve here and there to make 20 bucks a month a door somewhere, right? I'm actually looking into these deals. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we are here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today's interview is sponsored by Building Insurance and Risk. When you invest in real estate, it pays to work with a real estate investor protection specialist to protect yourself and your investment from catastrophic loss. The experts at Building Insurance and Risk focus on real estate investor protection. They provide you with multiple insurance coverage offers and a side-by-side -side coverage comparison. To learn more, go to buildinginsurancerisk.com. Today, my guest is Frank Shaw. Frank is an ex-engineering director in tech startup where he specialized in pricing and decision-making. He is passionate about AI and investing in real estate and alternative assets. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Frank Shaw about deal underwriting and raising capital for B and C class multifamily deals in Dallas, Texas. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple of things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Frank Shaw. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks for having me, Darren. Well, I'm I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation. But uh, before mm -hmm. we get started, if you could take just a minute and share a little bit about your background. Yeah, no problem. So um, over the past seven years, I've been working in tech industry. Um, my main responsibility was data scientist, machine learning engineer, engineer, and also a co-founder. So I spent the last of my five years pricing alternative assets, such as real estate, sports card, watches, et cetera. And uh, over the recent two years, I get fascinated about investing in real estate and then I doubled down my investment and up to this year, I decided to become a full-time investor. So this is how our journey has been translated. But I'm always a mass person in mind. I like pricing stuff. No, yeah, that's awesome. The, uh, it's interesting, your, uh, your background, data science, uh, I would think yeah. would lend, lend uh, very strongly to uh, underwriting of, of real estate. Um, you mentioned a couple other asset classes that I hadn't um, uh, really considered. I'm kind of curious. You mentioned uh, sports. Did you say sports memorabilia or? Yes, sports memorabilia. I'm kind of curious how that, that to me is a fascinating one, just from a standpoint of the rarity of mm -hmm. a, a particular thing, I'm assuming drives the, the price up quite a bit. Um, yeah. What other alternative assets have you found that uh, have uh, piqued your interest and or you've invested in? 
So right now, just sports memorabilia and watches because sport, sports memorabilia is more like a hobby of my partner, who's the CEO of the company. So we we started to start the start this um, company. Me personally, I invest in watches a lot because I like wearing luxury watches. Um, these are the two things we pay a lot of attention. But other people I know in the close circle, they invest in wines, they invest in arts. So whatever you see on the Sesby or Christie auction is the is the buy box of our like our our circle. So we we like collecting these physical goods. Got it. And on on uh, those types of items, is the 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 plan to buy and hold, or is it more of like a recognize a underpriced opportunity, buy and resell? Yeah. So there are, there are basically two type of strategy over there. Number one is speculating. Number two is um, bet on the market. So if you are doing speculating, you are basically buying an item at a cheaper price and sell it at a higher price. So technically, this can be achieved by uh, buying a item from a less from from less experienced people and sell it to a seasoned collector. You're basically arbitraging how different people perceive the the price. Um, the other one is you basically arbitraging between different platforms. For example, you buy it from China and you sell it on eBay, or you buy it on eBay and sell it in China. Um, the third one is basically uh that's that one is more like sports car specific because sports car there's raw car and there's graded car, and when you you're trying to grade a car and the grade is great. The grading itself add a lot of value onto the card itself. So a good eye would identify something raw and purchase at a lower price, send it to PSA or BGS, have it graded like PSA 10 or PSA 9 or BGS 9.5, and, and the price increase maybe 20% directly. So as long as the cost paid off, it's a good bet. So this is about speculating. Yeah. And and by and hold, you are basically betting like, okay, more people is going to this hobby. The the trend is going up. People are willing to spend more money. But this is more correlated with the market condition. And as you can see over the past few years, sports car raised a lot during COVID because everybody has a lot of money. But right now it tanks. So different people profit differently in in, in such a market. That's fascinating. Well, I appreciate you uh, sharing a little bit about the uh, memorabilia and and uh, you know wine and and watches and and all that. That's that's fascinating. But mm-hmm. let's talk about uh, the uh, real estate. I'm curious, what drew you uh, to invest in real estate? Yeah. So I always so so I think it's it's the, like the, everything uh, boiled down to the Kiyosaki's bridge to that for that book, right? He talked about how to earn passive income. And I, I know this concept when I was a kid. And um, I'm basically, my strategy was basically starting to collect rent and uh, become a landlord and earn passive income. And I started, the, the, my, my journey is like, okay, single family, condos, et cetera. But then I realized, okay, the, the speed of accumulating of, of wealth over there is very slow for two reasons number one is that um the i, I used to live in san francisco and also obviously like that the, the um, rent to uh purchase rate isn't really good so i wasn't able to make any positive cash flow over there and then i have to trend it into other market for example tampa florida um, phoenix arizona or dallas and then i become more affluent of buying these homes up until the point that um, I get bottleneck by my mortgage broker. They say, okay, you are not able to borrow more money because your debt to income ratio is that high. Then I transition into multifamily because I want to over uh, overcome that bottleneck. So that's how I end up putting to right now. But I think real estate has been a very solid investment compared to other collectibles because other collectibles doesn't generate income versus real estate that generates income. So the pricing is a little bit different. And I think real estate is more robust because it always produces income. It will always have a price. No, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I'm curious, you mentioned uh, rich dad, poor dad, and, and uh, I thought I heard you mention as a, as a child or as a kid, you had kind of understood this concept. Uh, did, did, is your family into real estate or how, what, what was your kind of earliest? Um, 
they uh they do real estate investment in China, but that's a very different game. China is more about speculating on prices instead of rent. Because you know, like over the past 10 years, the price just surged. So whoever purchased the real estate doesn't really matter what they purchase, they they make great uh, return. So um I started to know Rich Dad Poor Dad, I think from a friend instead of my parents. My parents didn't really care about generating these kind of assets. So I have to kind of learn the hard way. So I spent a lot of time learning how to build up wealth myself. Got it. Got it. So, all right. So you mentioned you uh, started doing single family. Uh, mm -hmm. You struggled in some of the markets. You found some markets with cash flow. Uh, and then the uh, the mortgage, your, your debt to income uh, ratio basically uh, capped your ability to, to continue. Um, so how, how have you gone about investing in multifamily? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's more of a luck. Um, I was talking to a random friend and he was bringing up this multifamily concept. And at the beginning I was thinking he's maybe just buying these duplex, triplex or quadplex. And then he told me he's buying like hundred unit, 200 unit. I was like, how, how is it possible? And then he explained the concept of like syndications, called GP business model or other business model. But then I was like, oh, okay. Now I see how, how the game is playing out. So I, I chip in a little bit of money with him as the LP of a few deals a few years ago. And I just started to grill this person about all of the underwriting questions because I'm very responsible for my money. Um, so I, I learned it over the past two years to understand like end to end how like a deal underwriting sourcing goes. And then I feel like, okay, this is something I'm very comfortable. I'm able to do it myself. And I think because I'm spending more and more money into this business, I'm doing my own, I'm doing my own underwriting. Why don't I become an investor and help other people to build up their wealth as well? So this is kind of the journey I, I started. Got it. So you you started as an LP then? Is mm -hmm. that okay? Yeah. And in the, uh, did I hear you right, two years is kind of the... the yeah, two and a half, two and a half, two years, and a half years ago. Okay. Yeah. In, in the two and a half years, a lot's changed. I mean, uh, during COVID, the market was kind of, uh, everybody thought it was going to stop and it just went nuts Yeah. Uh, with all of the uh, low interest rates and, mm -hmm. and uh, opportunities. So I'm curious, how many... How many um, deals have you invested in, and if any have uh, gone full cycle? Uh, yeah, this was you know been yeah yeah. yeah. So it's, it was three deals, um, okay. maybe seven hundred dollars in total. Um, one went out full cycle. One is doing okay, but you, we just cannot perform, uh, sell at good price. And the other one is mediocre, I would say. So I think one. Exit full circle, two years, thirty seven percent of return on the cash oh, so on the capital side. Seventy seven percent in two years. Thirty seven, thirty seven. Sorry, seven seven. So, three seven. Oh, three seven. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Annualized, maybe like twenty percent. Okay. Well, three seven in two years, still pretty good. Circle, yeah. 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 And um, okay, and then you mentioned that. One is okay and one's kind of mediocre. Are uh, I'm I'm hoping uh, that that all of them are still um, viable. Or have you had any? Or, or the I guess here here's what I see, and you tell me what what your situation is. Is basically mm -hmm. it's a matter of the interest rate and refinance coming due, and and whether or not there's buyers, uh, you know, that are whether or not the the deal is going to be able to hit its. Uh, projected exit. Um, yeah. Right. So, the use so, yeah. So, so they are using interest, uh, flowing, flowing interest, but uh, they actually bought a long enough cap. So the the downside, the risk isn't really about interest rate currently. It's more about the unforeseen tax, uh, the the tax increase, and we just have to um, fight every year about this tax situation, which didn't end up with any cash flow. So tax I situation think, meaning property taxes? Yes, property taxes. Okay. Yeah, because that this is just a new new one and also insurance grows a lot. 
so it's it's mainly these two components that basically eat up all of the cash flows. When I say when I say not good, meaning that we're not distributing we're not distributing uh caches. It's not about the properties being distressed or not, just no cash return on that. Got it. And uh so while while no um quarterly or, or monthly uh cash, the the asset's still performing. It's just a matter of some of the expenses have have yep. uh, grown beyond yep. what the projections were, right? Namely, right. the insurance and the uh, uh, property taxes, right? Got it. Got yep. it. All right. So you 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 invested in three as a limited partner, and you mentioned that uh, based on your uh, understanding and and you know interest in this, that you're you're ready to go on and be a, a general partner. If I understood correct, is that? That were yeah. your so be a deal sponsor. So I choose my position very strategically because I live in Orange County. I don't live in Dallas. I don't see myself operating the deals. I don't see myself being able to compete with other GPs to fight for um, brokers relationship. Um, I don't play golf, so I it's harder for me to build a relationship with local dealers. So I choose not to become a lead GP. I choose to more become a uh, money raiser and also earn the riders. So my strategy is basically to collaborate with lead GP that I know. I build up trust for a while and then I help them to bring in some money and also earn the right deals. So this is kind of my value add in this situation. Got it. And so in that uh, you're not the the operator, how do you uh, go about selecting or w what's your criteria for underwriting a general partner operator uh, that you're going mm -hmm. to invest in or invest yeah. with? Yeah, so, right. So uh, you raised a very good question. So there's basically two parts of underwriting, right? You basically underwrite the people. You also, vetting the people, you also underwrite the deals. So for me, um, I think... I still haven't talked to enough operator. I probably talked to 20 so far, like like, like deep conversation 20. I mean, I probably met 50, of, but I, I probably only had deep conversation with 20 of the people. I only currently have two people or two groups that I trust. So how I vetted people is basically, I try, I'm trying to understand, okay, what is their philosophy, right? Number two is, how much is their skin in the game? Meaning that like what percentage of acquisition fee they took, how much their own money are they putting in to calculate the skin in the game? Um, what's the carry or the structure of the deal? Are they using waterfall? Are they using pure 220? Um, those kind of skin in the game. Number three is that how big is their property? Uh, sorry, how big is their portfolio versus how big is their team? So a red flag will be somebody that grow exponentially without growing too much of their team, which stretch them very thin. And number four is are they how spread how spreading are they like are they are they all over the places? Are they like sometimes in Georgia, sometimes in Dallas, sometimes in Florida, or are they just focus on Dallas? How much uh, number five is how much daily? What do they do on a daily basis? How hands on are they? How much delegation do they delegate to the uh, property management versus how much do they like oversee everything? So basically, I'm looking for uh, a boutique shop, like a boutique company that doesn't own a lot of things. Because if you own a lot of things, then you have to also make sure they have the system to manage like 10, 20 properties. I'm currently only looking for a boutique versus like big. Boutique meaning maybe they own also like they only manage five properties or three to five property. Let's say maybe a thousand doors. They are capable of doing five property by themselves. They are able to find, optimize their um, contractors, their prices, their vendors by themselves. They're not fully integrated yet, but I know these people is gonna spend money very wisely. They're gonna eagerly to make the property work because. They have a huge skin in the game, right? They're not taking a lot of money out up front, which means that their own 
return is very correlated to the performance of the properties. So, so this kind of GPs are the ones I, I like the best so far. <clears throat> And in that, I'm just curious uh, as you go and and um, you know interview or qualify a different uh, potential GPs, is there a, a an average number of years or experience that these uh, tend to have that that are meeting your criteria? Um, so the two that I trust, number one, he's in the business for ten years, and he just choose to operate boutique like 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 not growing up the other one he just started three years ago so <clears throat> i want to make sure at least they have two or one full exit and i want to also see how they're managed right now how they communicate to to the investor what type of report do they send what do they do on their daily basis and also i will also pay attention to how do they how did they end the right the deals few years ago versus how that deal performed. I will basically say, hey, can you send me your underwriting files for that deals you closed three years ago and how did that perform? I will ask him to benchmark. Did that person actually perform what he's committed to do, right? The, perform the person say, okay, you're going to build up this dog park. You're going to build up 50 reserve parking. You're going to build up like 50 park uh, park lot, car carport, sorry. You're going to build up 50 carport. Right, you're gonna transfer this laundry machine to Amazon lockers. Did you actually do it? Are you gonna build back? Did you actually build back the, the, the utility to the tenant? Did you actually raise the rent 10%? So actually I, I check if they did what they promised they're gonna do. This is an implication of okay, are they gonna do what they think they're gonna do in the next end already? So I think this tells me a lot. Yeah, no, it's one thing to have a plan. It's the execution that that uh, you know determines the results. Right. Uh, so, so that that makes sense to me. Um, I'm curious. You know the the uh, well, I'm just trying to think. The, the the two parties that you mentioned, the the one that has uh, three years and the one that has ten years. Yeah. Um, in the last ten years, the market has. Let's see. Well. 2008 was the, so we're beyond the crash by it's, right. right now we're, we're recording December of 2023. So that would put us a, you know, approximately 15 years uh, past the, the crash. Uh, so, and, and we haven't had a quote crash, but we've had certainly some interest rate, uh, you know, interest rates went down. Now they've risen, uh, which essentially creates a cycle uh, within the, the structure of commercial debt. Um, how how do you see when you, when you review the past performance of these uh, parties that you're you're interested in investing in? Mm -hmm. How how are they seeing or how are they responding differently or, or re reacting or responding to the the market conditions uh, to to create a, a positive outcome for their their investors? Yeah, so this is a very good question. So um, short answer is we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I think anybody who predict, okay, the interest is going to go down, it's kind of betting. They don't, like, nobody can clearly say what's really going to happen. Then my philosophy of investing is, number one, don't lose money. Number two, don't forget about rule number one. I mean, don't, don't lose money. Number three, don't forget rule number two and number one. So, so. I'm basically trying to figure out, or we, like the, me and these two GPs, we both, like all of us agree that we want to currently buy deals that will yield us a reasonable return, even though the interest rate didn't change. And that's a very conservative assumption. Versus a lot of other GPs, like I, I probably underwrite 20 deals over the past a few months. And most of the deals, they're going to present it to me, say, hey, we're going to give you 14% LR because our exit cap rate is going to be 1.5% lower because we do expect the interest rate is going to go lower. And this is a, a super red flag to me because that seems the only reason 
to make money on this deal, right? So you you like you you are basically only betting on interest rate, not other stuff. And this is basically a bad sign because I could just bet interest rate elsewhere. Why would I bet the interest rate on, on real estate? So I'm basically trying to figure out, okay, how does a new deal make money? Basically, there are three ways to make the deal. Uh, sorry, there are basically three ways right now for a deal to make money. Number one is you basically raise the rent. Number two is you improve your operation or you improve your non-operating, sorry, non-rental income. And number three is your interest rate of the market, right? I want to make sure that I don't control the market, but I can control the non the, the non-rental income and also the rent, right? I want to make sure that I'm able to have enough meat on the bone that even though there's nothing happen on the on the rate side, I can also make a lot of money on the other two. This basically yield down to a property that doesn't have the highest rent over its neighborhood. This also means that the property has a lot of uh, meat on the bone on the non-rental income side that I can, for example, build back to the tenant or I can improve here and there to make 20 bucks a month a door somewhere, right? I'm actually looking into these deals. Yeah, I think you're uh, spot on as far as, um, you know, I had somebody else, you know, tell me that if you couldn't make money in real estate here in the last 10 years, then you shouldn't be in business, you know, shouldn't be doing it right now <clears throat> based on, you know, the, the market was just so uh, ripe and there was so much demand and, you know, capital was so cheap that yeah. uh, all you had to do is buy one and sell one and you were making money. Right. And, uh, but like you said, uh, it was kind of a, um, you know, uh, the, the market, it didn't, it didn't take any effort on your part, basically is what it did. Whereas now right. the, the things that you're mentioning, the ability to uh, increase revenue or decrease your expenses, uh, is really, that's it. I mean, it's up to the operator to be able to figure out a way to do that. Yeah. Uh, because the, the, uh, interest rates are clearly out of your control. Uh, and even if you ex execute your plan perfectly, if you're, if you're, if your strategy is, you know, the hope that interest rates will fall and, and, uh, the buyer will be able to spend more than, than, uh, you know, in a higher interest rate market, that that's uh, probably, uh, uh, not the best strategy. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about the criteria that you look at for, uh, qualifying a, a, a general partner to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the the actual property? Tell me a little bit about some of the, um, you know, strategies and or criteria that you look for when uh, selecting a a um, yeah. property to to invest in. Yeah. So I'm a very number person. Um, I believe in fundamentals. So. My goal is to minimize my risk before closing. And then I can rest assured because most of the work for me is done during the underwriting time. I have almost zero control after the deal gets closed, right? I can only influence the operator, but I have technically no control of how the deal is gonna perform. So underwriting deal is the most important thing that I can protect my money or I can either win or, or lose. And it's going to be three years, five years to prove myself if I'm doing good or not. Right. So I, I treat this very seriously. Um, number. So, so how I actually underwrite the deal. I, and so, so I basically figure out, okay, what type of property do I know? And I can mathematically underwrite it. And this basically yields to class B. Class C plus usually because class A, um, the return is slightly small, uh, lower than, than my expectations. So, so I kind of haven't really looked at class A plus class A require more money and operators. I, I know they have no experience of underwriting or, or manage class A because it's just a uh, bigger operations. Right? So I currently don't know how to underwrite class A. That's just all of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. I'm very good at, I would say right now for class B, class C, because I just been underwriting these deals over the past few, few months, like half year, probably. 
Um, so I'm currently focused on class B, class C. In the future, I'm probably gonna expand into other asset classes, for example, self-storage, for example, mobile park, um, or, sorry, mobile homes, parking, uh, self, uh, parking lot, etc. But right now I think class B, class C are my bread and butter. So how do I underwrite class B, class C? It's basically, a, uh, it's a very formal underwriting process. You basically grab their OMs, grab the co stop report, grab their rent roll, T12, right? And plug it into a giant spreadsheet that is pretty available online. And then you also change your assumptions. So I think there's like grabbing the number, which is kind of the same, and also putting out assumptions. And that gives you a number of return, right? So I think the most important thing is to figure out what assumption do you use for these projections. This basically includes, okay, exit cap rate. This is the biggest number. Um, your rent growth, right? What you're going to do for... Um, for, for non-rental income, what are you going to do for your expenses and how much CapEx do you put? I currently don't know too much about CapEx because I'm not an operation person. So vets, vets, uh, vetting the GP helps a lot, right? I usually trust the GP for their CapEx side. I personally put a lot of emphasis on the other assumptions. For example, rent growth. I'm currently not giving more than two and a half percent annually for the rent growth. Not, not, not taking into consideration of renovation. Okay, renovation basically does its own bump, but if status quo, I'm assume maybe two and a half percent over there. For the exit cap rate, I'm usually assume whatever the acquisition cap rate plus 50 basis point. This is my like backed envelope underwriting for the cap rate. I can go deeper into underwriting of cap rate by using multiple data points. Maybe I pull the co-star report, see what's the market, and plus 50 basis point on top of that, if the deal was so good. So basically I want to make sure, okay, after all of these assumptions work, I can still achieve maybe 14% LR for GP, sorry, for LP, for my LP. I think that's a very good signal to pull the trigger. And unfortunately, um, Due to that very restrictive underwriting process, the GPs I've been working on lost a lot of biddings to other GPs over the past few months. And I think that's okay because I don't want to just wait the deal for the sake of giving more price because there are always going to be somebody who's willing to pay more to win the deal, but they're just paying too much. And I don't want to end up with doing that. I'll just wait. So <clears throat> I want to make sure I understood uh, the, on the exit uh, cap rate you're projecting, you, you're, you're taking the entry cap rate and adding half a, half a point. Half, is that right? Half a point, pretty much. Okay. So if, what are you seeing right now as a market uh, cap rate in the, the Dallas BC class code or not class code? Yeah. The, the, uh, class of uh, properties as far as a, an offering uh, cap rate? Yeah, so so I think it depends on regions, but most of the region I underwrite, I think class B is about 55 5 and 6%, and class C is like 6 and 7%. That's usually how, how I see it. But but I mean, but the asking price is usually 1% lower. So there's a huge gap between asking and bid. Right. So for selling they are giving you a 4.5% of cap rate. I was like, okay, this is not going to work for us. But 4.5% is probably the only rate they're not going to lose money on their side. So there's a gap between what people are willing to let go versus what people are willing to pay. And I think that's also a reason of there's so little transactions on the market. Sure. When you do your underwriting and you're looking at the actual uh, rent, uh, rent roll and, and, um, you know, calculating the the cap rate, presumably it's off whatever they're they're actually doing. Uh, if it's substantially under market, do you uh, give yourself any kind of a a leeway, kind of a room as to how much you can go higher than that, based on you know if 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 the uh, 
current rent is X and you know that the, uh, you know, the market rate is, you know, X times, you know, 1.25 or whatever, uh, meaning there's so, substantial room. Got it. So I'm trying to understand why the current rent is much lower. It's, there's usually two reasons, right? Number one is the the, op, the current owner is not doing a good job for whatever reason. It's either they are a mom and pop shop or they live in a different state. They just don't pay attention. There's another reason is that, okay, maybe there's something wrong with, with the property. People are just not willing to pay that high, right? So I'm trying to debug what's the reason. If the, the, the data tells me it's more about the operation, then I probably can bump it up more aggressively. But if the reason is that, oh, it's just because this this location is weird, right? There's like three other locations that have a better visibility or, or for whatever reason, people just don't like this kind of unit layout or et cetera, I, I will be very conservative. So I'm trying to figure out why this is low. Got it. And as far as the uh, the B and C class properties that you're underwriting, is there a um, uh, number of doors that you focus on? Mm, good question. So uh, most of the deals I, like that's being brought to me is usually 150 to 250 doors. So mm -hmm. this basically justify a full on-site property management team. No, makes sense. And what what are the projected hold times uh, in your yeah, in your models that you're you're looking at for uh, acquisition. Um, right now, I'm currently giving myself three three to seven years of exit. So when I'm using debt, I'll probably use a longer term fixed debt, maybe seven to ten years. So my strategy right now is I want to experience another cycle and sell that at a better price. Maybe I will refinance in the middle, but my goal is basically give myself, I, I learned from the past, right? I basically give myself a longer period of time to hold it. Unless it's like a super, like deal by deal is different, right? Unless this deal is purely about just fix, sorry, flip, fix or flip. Otherwise, if it's just, every, it's a standard deals, I'll give myself very long time to, to realize over there. No, makes sense. Uh, for debt, what are you seeing the, uh... Uh, the interest rates that are being offered and what kind of uh, down payment percentage and and uh, length of uh, of uh, term on the on the debt. What what are you seeing right now? Yeah, that's that's actually not my expertise, but most of the deals I saw is around six percent, thirty percent down, thirty percent down. Uh, ag agency loan. Agency, okay. Yeah, and w is that uh, seven to ten years then on the uh, yeah the term? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we had a deal that you can assume a debt. And also, I think that that was like very good. But for whatever reason, we passed it. But most of the most of the deals are fixed, 7 to 10 years. Got it. So as a, uh, a capital raiser, uh, what is the, um, uh, the, the temperature of the uh, investors that you're approaching? What's their... What's their uh, uh, response are they eager to invest are they cautious what 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 are you hearing so i think it depends on how they well first of all most of uh, i think almost all of my investors right now are accredited and these accredited investors make their fortune differently right there are basically two type of ways they they make up their fortune number one is they in tech industry they had a big check they are millionaires Another way is like they are financial workers, they are just super high pay and they are very good at investing. So if it's more tech, they are less educated and they are looking for a way to park their money with reasonable return. And they are willing to do that because right now the only thing they can invest right now is, is, the, is the treasury and the CD, right? So right now they're getting paid 5%, 6%. And if I can offer them a 10%, 14% annualized return, this is a much better return for them. Other side of my 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 circle, they are super good at investing because they, they work in the finance industry, they work in the hedge fund. They are very picky about how they invest and they invest in real estate just mainly for the sake of diversification. 
So these people are very conservative right now because they 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 park most of their money in their bank and they're just waiting because they have their own thesis. They want to deploy their money at the right time. So they're basically separated. Like one group, the tech group, they are they are just looking for better opportunities versus the finance group, they are strategically waiting. So so I think this part is easier to raise versus this is more hard. Yeah. No, I I I think that's kind of what I'm hearing is um I hear there's lots of opportunities. I hear there's lots of opportunities that are due to come to market based on just the cycle of financing that's in place. Right. Um and I think it all kind of comes back to the interest rate, you know, that the Fed uh, is making available. Um yeah. the uh last I heard is the commitment is to not raise rates anymore and and the foreshadowing is that they plan to cut rates, but um, you know who knows uh, what the what the uh, if you know if the numbers present something that doesn't make or hold that to be true, um, you know that could be could be more worrisome. But um, yeah, uh, you know out of out of my control. More you know pay attention to what's what's in front of us that's real, and yeah. uh, like you've said the the rent is real, you know, if there's expense, expenses that can be cut or were transferred to the, um, the residents, um, you know, these are ways you can improve your numbers here. I like it. That, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, Hey Frank, if we could, I'd like to shift gears here for a second. Um, by day I'm an insurance broker and uh, as such, I work with my clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. And there are three strategies that we typically uh, consider. Uh, we first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. When that's not an option, we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And if we cannot avoid nor minimize the risk, then we look to see if there's a way we can transfer the risk. And that's what an insurance policy is. And as such, I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. Could be interest rates, um, investors, uh, you know, the market, uh, whatever it is that you you see in your situation that you consider to be the biggest risk. And uh, again, for clarification, while I am an insurance broker, I am not necessarily looking for an insurance-related answer. And so if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Frank Shaw, what is the biggest risk? I think the biggest risk for me is, I think, interest rate right now. And how I choose to, I don't think I can transfer that, but I think I can minimize it Number for, for, a few, for a few strategy. Number one is I just invest less deals because the less you invest, the less risk you expose, right? But, you, it, but if you don't invest anything, then you have no income, then that's not an option. So you have to participate but you can participate very strategically. So that's number one. Number two is you can use um, a fixed rate mortgage to alleviate your risk, right? Instead of a few years back, everybody is using floating interest rate with two years of rate cap. So we learned the lesson. You're going to be more conservative using a fixed rate mortgage. So that's number two. Number three is that uh, we are looking for cheaper price. We're giving us more um buffer so that we can tolerate this kind of risk. So these are the three things we're currently doing. But the biggest risk to us right now are interest rate. No, well, it's well said. Uh make your money on the buy. And if you don't buy right, uh you know, make makes it difficult to exit right. So that's yeah. good. Yeah. Frank Shaw, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? Yeah, so right now I'm mostly active on LinkedIn. So my LinkedIn huddle is Frank the Tank CFA. And I post daily about career. I post daily about wealth creation and I talk about startups and entrepreneurship. Give that to me one more time. Frank the what? Frank the Tank CFA. Tank. Yeah. CFA, gotcha. Got it. Well, let's send the show notes and uh, so the listeners can find you. Yep. 
Right. Frank Shaw, I cannot say thanks enough for uh, taking the time to talk today. Uh, I've enjoyed it, uh, learned a lot, and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Yep. Thank you very much for having me today, Darren. You got it. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's C-R-E-P-N Radio. You're listening to C-R-E-P-N Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, C-R-E-P-N Radio.